We don't do it to be loved. We don't do it to be popular. Well, I'm not saying, but, we, you, but we, you should be doing it to be effective. And until that moment, until Coco Gauff came out and said that, the effect that you were having, I think, was negative. Climate protests at the US Open. Right move or wrong? Do you think that this form of protest is justified and or effective? Let's start with you, Noam. Um, so I think it's, it's certainly justified in terms of the overall context of the urgency for taking climate action. Um, whether it's effective, I think that's the, that's the real question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, you know, obviously I'm not part of XR and, and I'm not, you know, privy to the strategy behind it. But one thing that I question and I wonder from an outside point of view is whether this is putting pressure on the right audience and whether it's interrupting the right group. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly this is an important event. It's a very uh, public event. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in the back of the video, there's a, there's a logo, there's a corporate logo of Emirates Airline. And shouldn't we be focusing on putting pressure on companies that are emitting uh, or supporting fossil fuels. And so that's really what I wonder is who the audience is mm -hmm. um, and who we're trying to interrupt. Um, and so that's my sense of, you know, just more having more questions than answers really when I see that video. Nice, anyone else wanna weigh in? Yeah, I wanna say that I, I think that the protest at that tennis match was effective. I think it was appropriate because they're all human in that stadium. And not only are, are we looking at in-person viewers, we're looking at people who are viewing through um, uh, telecast, people who are viewing after the fact, and it's bringing attention to something that will affect and impact everyone. I'm concerned about the seventh generation from now. And if we sit back and watch our so-called gladiator games and our sports events, and Lala, I don't care about that, you go, you tree huggers, whatever, you're gonna need to hug a tree to get that oxygen as well. So to me, it's everybody's responsibility. And if you're so uncomfortable about your tennis match being interrupted, then too bad for you. You should be interrupted because our oxygen is being interrupted. Our planet is being interrupted. Mother Earth needs attention. And if we can get a captive audience that large, then we should go on and do it. And I'm all for it. I'm gonna follow up with you and anyone else can weigh in. Um, some of the criticism that Extinction Rebellion got for this type of protest came um, from the tennis community itself. People even said, you know, how dare you interrupt someone's career like that. Um, the players, Coco Goff and Carolina Makova, I think I'm pronouncing that right, um, you know, were forced to respond to this kind of disruption. And um, I, know for, I know for a fact that it, Coco Goff ultimately won the match, but it was, it, you know, it was, just, it was disruptive for her. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I really don't have any respect for the disruption of your frivolous tennis match. It's nice, it's cute, it's entertaining. But at what point do we sacrifice humanity for entertainment? So Coco Golf was gonna win regardless, because if you're ready, you're ready. And an interruption of uh, people protesting for not, hey, look at me for no reason. It is a matter of life and death the life and death of this planet and every living creature on it. So, too bad. I, I, I used to like follow tennis uh, quite a bit, and interruption is just a part of tennis. I mean, uh, Arthur Ashe got this covered stadium, the stadium cover, like, I don't know, like maybe five, six years ago, not that long ago. And even now, most of their courts are not covered. So interruption, per se, is not such a like outlandishly like novel thing in, in tennis at all. It's just a part of the game. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and climate interruptions will become like more and more frequent. And just, I think it was the previous day, the men's number two or number four, I forget, he, he practically collapsed on the court from heat. So, I mean, what kind of interruption are you talking about? Death there? So, I mean, this is like nothing uh, compared uh, to, to the interruption that I did uh, mm -hmm. in the match. That's right, you were one of the protesters. Yes, thank you. Can I ask a question about the, the approach? Because I think certainly tennis, and the, I'm not a huge tennis fan, but uh, Tennis Association uh, accepts money from fossil fuel companies and you know, certainly in, 
institutions that you know fund fossil fuel infrastructure. So was there any sort of engagement with the Tennis Association to try to have disinvestment as a part of the interruption? Because I think interruption is important if it's partnered and, and accompanied by direct engagement with leadership to, to try to really stop the funding and support from divestment. a financial perspective. Divestment, divestment. Yeah. 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 I I have a thought on that. Yeah. So whenever people are thinking about what to do, there's an infinitude of things that they can't do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, there's so many people that are not being spoken with. There's so many institutions that haven't been approached in the perfect way. And there's so many w reasons to say, now is not the time for this particular thing that's upsetting and disruptive. <laughs> but if you just wait for the perfect time, nothing will ever happen. Ever. So to answer your question, I don't think anybody really thought out some campaign to get the USTA to change who their sponsors were. Mm -hmm. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but I don't actually think that matters. I feel like the, the action should be judged on its own merits, not on what else could have happened before. Yeah, to respond to that, I agree that divestment is super important and like that message should get across when we do actions like this. Um, but uh, you asked earlier, like, who is the audience? Um, and I think that the disruption is more a disruption of our business as usual. Um, so, you know, I think that when we disrupt at very, very public events, we are telling the public, hey guys, this is urgent and everyone should probably roll up their sleeves and do something. So, you know, while, while focusing on you know, the funding is really critical, I think a lot of times that is our goal in these actions. And there are a variety of angles to uh, help to fix climate change, to mitigate climate change. We can speak up to create awareness. We can go into service and, and, and exercise our rights as citizens, and you know you were concerned about that, and speak up. I've been very effective with legislators in my state and on Capitol Hill mm -hmm. with uh, representatives such as Mikey Sherrill of New Jersey, I have to plug her, because uh, trying to get the Farm Bill passed mm -hmm. in everyday actions, bringing attention to it so that people can say, hey, what is this? Let me look into it. There's also the advocacy that we need to get involved in. Mm -hmm. And then the, phil the philanthropic portion, the divestment. We have to put our money where our mouth is. Mm -hmm. If we bring the attention and everything and we say, hey, let's start trying to get funding from other sources. Let's try to make sure that these funders are doing things that are sustainable yeah. for everyone. Mm -hmm. So we can't just say there's only one way to do it. Yeah. There's more than one way to skin a cat, unfortunately quote unquote, but we also have to look at how many ways can we attack this issue. We talk about fossil fuels. There are green energy sources that we can develop. We're looking at offshore wind. We have a whole industry that we can build and create in this country mm -hmm. that will solve so many other problems. So sustainability may be not just environmental, but also economic. Mm -hmm. So when we look at how are we gonna make this happen, we have to take action. I'm not gonna go and, and, and stand in front in the street because I know XR's rules. I'll stand on the sideline. Some folks have different experiences with you know, police and the criminal justice system. So we have to be strategic in every action that we take mm -hmm. so we can be effective from any angle. Thank you. Oh. You haven't yeah, spoken I, yet. Yeah, I, I have a I have very different opinion. <laughs> so the question was uh, uh, eff about efficacy and justified, right? And, uh, the justification, I think, is there because of the exigencies of the climate crisis, right? That's, to me, unquestionable. But uh, to go back, to Bill was saying the action should be judged on its own merits as it stood. And for me, that action was not effective until well after the match. And it wasn't even, I, I don't think it was a given that Coco Gauff would win that match. But after that match, after that match at the press conference, I remember her saying something to the effect like, I'm not going to lie, it bothered me that it was an interruption, but she said, that is an interruption just like having a rain delay. That action wasn't effective until she said that, because before that, a lot of people were pissed off and not happy about, about that interruption. And I think XR is just incredibly lucky that 
the woman who was most directly affected and you would think would be the most resentful about the action came out and said something that was very kind and really helped reorient everyone's understanding of what happened. But before that happened, I guarantee you there are a lot more people that were pissed off than were yeah. feeling like they had been taught something effective. Wow. The moments like this, yeah, are def history defining moments. And like I said, I prefer it not to happen in my match, but I wasn't pissed at, you know, the protesters. I mean, I know the sta stadium was because it just interrupted entertainment. But, you know, I always speak about uh, preaching, you know, you know, preaching about what you feel and what you believe in. And it was done in a peaceful way, so I can't get too mad of it. One key thing to understand about civil disobedience is that we don't do it to be loved. We don't do it to be popular. Well, I'm not saying, but, we, you, but we, you should be doing it to be effective. And until that moment, until Coco Gauff came out and said that, the effect that you were having, I think, was negative. No, no, but the point is the negative in terms of what? In terms of whether people like XR. Not just about XR. It oh, is, about the climate movement. It, it, it is about, yes, yeah, yeah. it is about changing things. And you have to, ch and the people whose minds you have to change it's not about whether or not you want them to like you. It's about whether or not you want them to help you push things in the direction that you want to see them go. And when you do something like that, you take a profound risk that what you are going to do is going to have the exact opposite effect of what you want so them to do. Do you think do. someone would go out and buy an SUV because... Yes, so -called I do. I, I, I I'll, give you, I, I'll give you a direct example. Mm -hmm. So I'm someone who's like very technical and I love cars and people know I love cars. I had a friend in New Mexico who wanted to buy a Tesla. And I said, you know, New Mexico gets most of their electricity from coal. So if you drive a Tesla in New Mexico, you're probably having a bigger impact than driving a BMW SUV. And so what she did is she went out and bought a BMW SUV. And that's an example where someone is looking at what you're saying and taking something that you had no intention of them doing. Well, but it's, but it's like bitter medicine. But let, let, me, let me address that. It's like bitter medicine. You may not like the way it tastes in your mouth, but once it goes down and it settles in, it has a better impact. Those people may not be as intelligent as they should have been because they can go boo and be upset. But as soon as Coco Golf, as little sheep said, you know, I liked it. And they go, oh, okay. They are gullible. And if you get the right leadership in front of them to tell them how to think and what to think, they'll follow along. Then they probably say, oh, well, but let me look into this climate change. Point? So we have to be intelligent enough to say, if I bring the right attention to it in the right place and the right people speak up, those dingbats will follow and maybe they'll wake up and do better. I'd love to refocus the discussion a little bit. Shayok, it seems like there is a distinction between making people like you which was not the case, right? I think we can both say that. There were boos, people were yelling at you. You can see that people are angry in the video. Mm -hmm. There's a distinction between getting people to like you and using the platform. Mm -hmm. This protest made the New York Times, made USA Today, made NPR, countless other sources. Yes. Worldwide. S worldwide. Yes. We're just talking about American media here. So I wanna to try to understand if you see those goals as contrary, or do you have to pick one? Tell me a little bit about that. No, I mean, tell me, when was the last time climate was in the sports pages? Does, does anyone know? I, I, I don't know of an instance. This may have been the first time climate was in the sports pages. So you are reaching, you're reaching an audience that is never. I, I can tell you when the climate was in the sports pages. It's when there was no snow for the Olympics. That's, that's climate being in the sports pages. It okay. might not be as a, as a protest. It might not be, it's not, but climate has been in the sports pages, whether it's skiing, whether it's, um, I think it's in sailing quite a bit too. Like there was a, there was a, a time. A very popular sport. Well, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's not a lot of, uh, so those are both uh, the, uh, sports that rely on the climate in a way that other sports do not. But you do hear about things like, uh, football players expiring because of heat, because the general, the, the level of heat, especially in like high school where there's not climate control. Right, right, but that's attributed to weather and not climate. I would make that distinction. It was a hot day, they collapsed. Whereas this, like climate was in the sports pages. Mm -hmm. One thing that I just wanted to bring up, first of all, I, I admire you know, the, the fact that you are putting your body on the line, like all of you. The thing I wonder about is 
and when it's any action, it's about story and it's about audience. When it comes to these actions, what is the story that we want to convey and then who are we trying to reach? And I think yeah. for, for the most part, public perception is never going to be positive for direct action. It's always an interruption. It's always a kind of annoyance. And so I think where direct action really has the capability to make a difference is for putting pressure on people in power and, and sustained pressure and ratcheting that, power, ratcheting that pressure up. And so I wonder in an action like this whether we're putting pressure on the right people. Um, and if it's not focused on divestment, and the, the sources of funding and, and investment within the, the tennis community, then why are we interrupting the event? Is it just to say your life will be interrupted because of climate? Because I, I don't really necessarily know where that story takes us. Well, I think what happens is that every movement, every change in society, any society, was about disrupting the status quo. Yeah. If you can shake that basic flow and that foundation, yeah. to me it's effective. You start a conversation, you bring that media attention to it. Mm -hmm. Not just, oh, there's no snow because they have snow making machines. Yes, why, why are these athletes collapsing on the field? Because someone didn't make sure that they were hydrated. Someone didn't say, we're gonna take a few intermittent breaks. Yeah. It has to be about being strategic and being humane and thinking about what's gonna happen in the long run. Not just, oh, I'm just interrupted from my comfort zone. So. I don't care about somebody's comfort zone. We have to look at the zone of what is gonna be most effective, what's gonna be right, and what's gonna be most sustainable. And some people, everything about them is comfort. You gotta start being empathetic, yeah. empathetic yeah. to other people, to humanity. Thank so that's you. where we need to look. I'd like to, we're coming towards the end of the discussion, I'd like to round out um, our conversation by looking a little bit maybe about towards the history of protest and the t towards the history of civil disobedience. Yeah. Activists in XR, I think, see a tradition of civil disobedience in past social movements. Yeah. They see themselves as the next iteration of that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like the public perception, though, um, yeah. is, is the same. I think a lot of what we see is that people are annoyed at disruptions like this and annoyed at activists who care about this you know a lot and are vocal about it mm -hmm. maybe we could talk a little bit about what your ref what your all's reflections may be around um, how this embodies like a tradition of civil disobedience or, or doesn't yeah so um, the kind of the old wave activists that I've talked to they've talked about how they used to break laws which um, they saw as unjust. So they would do sit-ins because there was segregation um, and stuff like that. Um, and now we're in a new wave of activism where our generation is um, doing civil disobedience and breaking laws that are not directly related to um, the the issue at hand. So I think for the public, it, it can be a bit harder to grasp, like, why are they doing this? Um, but at the end of the day, I think that this this isn't gonna stop. So I love I love talking about, you know, the the action that um, you did, Shayok, um, as an isolated event, but I think it's really interesting to think about it as a collection of events like XR, we're growing, we're not gonna stop. And you are gonna continue to see us in the media. You, you are gonna continue to see us disrupting. So I think that psychologically, uh, the more that we um, express this, um, the more that uh, everyday people like me are going to say, wait, I think I, think I, should, I, think I should also be doing something. So, and in that way, the movement grows. I think that that psychological principle is really important, as in people are social creatures. And if everyone is acting like there's not an emergency, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like an emergency. Yeah. Even if a scientist will say, this is an emergency, this is an existential threat to civilization and life on Earth, the words aren't as important as that same scientist running around in the streets saying, freaking out and saying, this is crazy. We're talking about extinction of humanity, not something you know, like a bad economy here. Yeah. That exhibition of the emergency mode shifts our psychology. 
So seeing somebody do something as crazy and ridiculous as disrupting a tennis match, and, it, and yes, it's not the same as breaking a law that is in itself unjust. I, yeah. I, I think there should be laws about disrupting tennis matches, but it's the fact that they're doing that anyway without that like, clear-cut, easy-to-design yeah. message. It's that they're doing something crazy that exhibits this is an emergency. That emergency question is hopefully resonating with some people. And it's not going to resonate with everyone. It's, it's, it may not even resonate with the majority, but some people will be called. And they will also say to themselves, maybe it is an emergency. Maybe I should be acting like it's an emergency. Right. And the movement just keeps gaining momentum in that way. It's like the more people jump on, the more people jump I, on. I have a question. How many of you were brought to XR by something of a uh, civil disobedience movement or action that XR did. Well, I will respond to that. Since I was a kid, I've been an environmentalist. Ah, but that's, but be but that's but, before XR. But, that's but, before XR. So let me answer the question. So this is an open-ended question. The difference for me is that I've always been involved in this. But when I found, I knew about XR, but when I found that there was an opportunity for me to act in New York City, close to home, mm -hmm. I said, I need to get involved in this because, listen, historically, this is 2024. If it was 1924, I wouldn't be able to sit here with you all because people would be uncomfortable about civil disobedience. People would be uncomfortable about why is she speaking up? She's doing that stupid thing at a lunch counter. She's getting on my nerves. Why are they blocking this street? Why are they blocking this road? At the time, everybody's annoyed. But then in the end, yeah. when it makes that real impact and we change laws and we change rules and we get equity, inclusivity, and we get real impact and real change, then it's like, oh, well, look where we are. See, let's not talk about that. So we have to realize that at the time when, it's, when we're violating the status quo, we have to know that we're doing it to make an impact. That's what the civil yeah. disobedience is about. And that's a real lived experience. Yeah. I know, but it can be a negative impact too. It's not necessarily a positive impact that you are having. And well, that is the, that is for me. Let me tell you the negative impact. Before we started shooting, they talked about 1923 in Rosewood. They burned down a black town. Now, what could have been the negative impact? They destroyed them. 1921, Tulsa. Guess what? None of those people who were sleeping in those tents in Tulsa at Black Wall Street went and burned down the towns of those other people. That would have been a negative impact. But what we have to talk about when we deal with impact and we look at response, we have to know that I, as an African-American woman, can't sit here and be like, well, let me just not you know, make these people mad. That's ridiculous. No, I'm not saying so you have to understand that as a lived experience. What you're saying is you're annoying people. What, that's, that's not effective. First of all, who cares who was annoyed? What, is, what was effective was the, the, uh, the awareness that was brought to it and some of the changes that some of these companies made, some of the changes that the people made, some of the changed minds and attitudes after Coco Golf spoke on it. Yeah. So it was effective. It doesn't matter if it was effective right then. Those people that got beat over the head and got killed for protesting for civil rights with civil disobedience, you can say it wasn't effective. They died, but they died for a reason. People were uncomfortable for a reason because there was an, a systemic change and there was an impact. Okay, uh, I would like to respond to your question. Julian. So I um, joined XR in the fall after seeing the protest at the US Open. Woo! So, <laughs> yeah. yes, so yeah. And, and, That's and, why I'm here today. And, so. and, and I joined XR after I read about what they did in London. They shut down the city of London yes. through civil disobedience. That's what, I mean, that's practically why I heard of XR. I hadn't okay. heard of XR I, I guess I should have rephrased the question. It's not how many, people, how, how many of you were brought to XR by XR's action. It's about how many of you were brought to uh, climate activism through the uh, civil disobedience or actions of XR. Actually, I was brought to climate activism yeah. by XR's blocking of, of London, and I was not brought to XR. I, I went to like, let, let me go do the more effective things, like work on government policy. Yeah. I worked on like CLCPA legislation mm -hmm. as a citizen for a long time. I, 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 I went and lobbied uh, uh, sen state senators uh, and state legislators. And, and I worked on, and I, I know a lot of geeky stuff about CLCPA because I thought that, that is the effective thing. Yeah. The state is going to go to net zero, let's work on effective stuff. So I was brought into climate activism by XR, but not to XR. I went into this legislation stuff, and I, and I was in that space for over a year. And then I realized this is not getting anywhere. And then I went into XR. Yeah. 
Julian, it sounds like you have seen some pretty negative outcomes from this specific protest. Yes. And, and ways that that might have hurt the climate movement in general. Maybe you could speak a little bit more specifically about negative, negative outcomes yeah. for a climate yeah, yeah. activist that yeah. came out of yeah. this protest. So I think, I, did I call myself a climate activist? I don't remember, but I'm definitely, I share the goal, right? Uh, the feedback that I get is, oh, look at that. Like, I think there's an art critic for New York Magazine. Who's, who, who, so in reaction to the throwing the soup on the Mona Lisa, his thing was, I love you, but I, I don't think he said hate, but I, I don't like this. And what is happening, what, and, and he's someone who is sympathetic to the movement, like Coco Gauff was sem sympathetic to the need for change. It is making people question whether or not this is a good way of going about it. And also from what I hear back from friends is, this is not productive and this is not helpful. All this is doing is making me feel anxious. And I get the comfort issue. That's certainly true. Like you don't want people to be totally comfortable and ignore the issue. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't want to make them uncomfortable and just stay away from the issue because, it, because the actions of XR make them uncomfortable. Okay, great discussion, everyone. Um, in light of the discussion, let's take a final vote, see if anyone's views have changed. Um, so was this, was this protest at the U.S. Open effective and, and or justified? Three, two, one. Okay, we've got one no vote. Noam, you want to tell us a little bit about your thoughts? Sure. I mean, I, I think the up or down is obviously incredibly binary. It's not, it's, not, <laughs> it's not totally fair. And so I think I appreciated hearing about, you know, the, the strategy and the, and the tactics behind, you know, what this... Uh, action was all about. I guess what, what I come down to, though, is that I think every climate action needs to be laser focused on pe making people in power and elite institutions uncomfortable. Mm. And so mm -hmm. I think that it's great to be able to say this is emergency. People can't go on like they have been mm -hmm. every single day. Mm -hmm. But I think that we just need to be incredibly focused in our actions to make sure that um, that we're putting pressure on those institutions that have the power to make massive change and to reverse course. Um, and we need to make those people uncomfortable and do it immediately. So I think it's not necessarily that I think that the action is unjustified. Um, I think that direct action is very important. I just think we need to be very clear in whatever action we're taking uh, about what the narrative is and who we're trying to convince. I don't think it's necessarily about convincing everybody in that stadium to take part in XR. That's not gonna be the case. But what we need to do is put pressure where it matters uh, and where influence and, act and actions can be most impactful. You can cut this, but I, I'll have to make a response to this. Please. Because, I, yeah. we, uh, because we, we have tried that. Right? Yeah. So uh, like the first half of the year, and like for years before that, yeah. we kept going after the bad guys. Well, like okay. who is funding fossil fuels? Yeah. So you keep like doing these demonstrations and you, we, I mean, that was my first arrest yeah. was in Citibank. We yeah. went into the Citibank lobby and stopped workers from growing in. Guess how much media coverage that got? Like close to zero. Yeah. So if a tree falls in the middle of the forest, you know, and no one hears about it, you do a protest at a bank and no one hears about it, no bank CEO gets any pressure at all. So the, go, the strategy of going after the bad guys doesn't really work because for one, like, people don't really care. They don't have that emotional investment in banks. They expect banks to be bad people and media doesn't care. So that's why that strategy in practice yeah. on the ground doesn't work, going after the bad people. But I guess there have been direct actions where we have gone after people in power. I mean, I just think of Nan Golden, right? Nan Golden laser focused on bringing attention to the opioid epidemic and goes into the Met, at the, you know, into the Sackler Wing uh, at the Temple of Dender. There are ways to Because make people, people care about the Met. Right. Because the media cares about the Met. No one really cares about banks. There is no emotional investment of the society in banks. So it's a little different. I love Nan Golden's actions, by yeah. the way. They are great. But it's only worked because people care about the Met. Yeah. But I mean, I guess what, what my thought would be is that there are an infinite possibility, possibilities in terms of getting people and taking direct action. And so, again, I'm not saying that, these, that this action shouldn't 
have been taken. I'm just wondering if there's other ways to make people in power feel uncomfortable uh, in a sustained way that does get the attention. And I, and I realize that, that there's a real challenge in that you're also responding to a media environment that is all about rage, right? And that, that it's all about getting clicks and views. And so yes. I'm not saying that this is I wonder, easy or, or, yeah. I wonder if the difference between Nan Golden going to the Sackler at the Met and going to the US Tennis Open is that Nan Golden is targeting the Sacklers. The US Open is not targeting Emirates Airlines, right? And the civil disobedience from the civil rights movement, that was about, we're gonna sit at the lunch counter, or I'm not gonna move to the back of the bus. And that's, that's very focused on what the goal is about. And inflicting economic pain. Right. Can you all right. maybe briefly describe um, Nan Golden and the Sacklers and what, what that was about? Sure, yeah, so Nan Golden, I mean, you might be able to talk about it more, <laughs> more effectively and maybe you yeah. studied it, but, but Nan Golden was uh, affected personally by the opioid ep epidemic, um, and she saw that she could use her power and her voice as an artist and as an art artist that was collected by these mass massive museums and institutions. And so she decided to take direct action and to disrupt activities at the museum. So she did a kind of, I think it was a staged uh, die-in, uh, and she floated um, fake prescription, um, prescription bottles in the, in the pools around mm -hmm. the Temple of Dender. Um, and so a very effective way to not just speak to the general public, but to say to the museum boards that you need to get these people off your boards, you need to change the names of these wings because the Sacklers are murderers. So, um, so it's, and before that action, I think Sacklers were, right, they were revered. They were just a household name. You might not have even heard of the Sacklers if you hadn't looked up onto the inscription on the wall. So I think that there's just ways to make people care about people who are in positions of power who, who you might not have heard of before through elevating their yeah. misdeeds. I mean, we use their names sometimes. We definitely go to museums, and if they receive dirty money, we bring a big banner, and uh, we will have their name. And um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully that, that comes across to them and uh, makes them pretty uncomfortable. Thanks. Guys, we're going to close. Uh, we have a special. Would you like to weigh in? Mm -hmm.